All right. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I'm excited today to talk to C.R. Wiley, who is doing great work right now looking into AI. And he's been posting information, insights about this that caught my attention because I've done a little bit of work in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. And you found some great material. So, Chris, thanks for joining us. Well, uh, uh, thanks for having me, Owen. It's good to be with you. Yeah, I'm glad to get to talk to you finally. I've followed your material for a long time. You do you have a lot of really good information on social media for reformed theology and some just good advice. I mean, call it dad advice. If that's all right. That's right. Uh, just good uh, dad advice. Yeah, it's kind of an odd thing to to be my age and have a church full of guys who could be my kids. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a weird thing. I mean, literally, I mean, I've got you know, you know, a few hundred people that literally could be my kids. <laughs> yep. Well, and and I think that we see in culture a real need for young men to find good advice. And so they're looking at some sources that may not be good, or maybe they're somewhat neutral, like Jordan Peterson has some good advice, but obviously he's he's not not actually a Christian. When he speaks positive of the Bible, it's more like Joseph Campbell from the old yeah, days. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely, um, yeah. So it's good to let people know, hey, there are great resources and young men do need good advice and need role models to follow. And so we'll have all of your information in the description for this video. Um, so maybe we'll get to that. We'll start with AI, but we might get to some of those kinds of topics. You and I had uh, interacted a little bit on Facebook about that idea of fighting and that idea of courage. So yeah. we'll, we'll come to those towards the end, but just tell us what got your attention for AI? How did that get on your radar and, and what are some of the things you're finding? Well, like you, Owen, I've got uh, you know some background in philosophy. Obviously, you teach it at the uh, you know the graduate the undergraduate yeah. undergraduate level, I believe, right? Yeah. So, uh, so you know, I'm thinking about that kind of stuff, but I'm also kind of thinking about what I need to prepare for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I lived in Cambridge back in the '90s, it was pretty evident that the woke wave was going to sweep across America because, you know, in those days, you know, that was kind of like the incubator for all of this, or yeah. one of the incubators, and. And people thought I was nuts, you know, when I would when I tell them what was coming. Uh, but that was a that is a place where, you know, kind of the next uh, sort of generation of, the, of our elite class are educated. So yep. you know, you could kind of say, well, it's going to happen. Yep. <laughs> and yeah, now, be the uh, teachers, administrators, uh, right. social leaders, yep, yeah. And, and I think the same kind of uh, phenomenon is occurring with AI. I guess where I first uh, became. Uh, I guess aware of trends and so forth was reading Ray Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen a documentary uh, about Kurzweil, and I think I was actually kind of tuned into Kurzweil through, if I remember correctly, uh, Ken Myers over at Marcel Audio. So Ken and I have a friendship goes way back, and I've been a subscriber to Marcel Audio since the early '90s, and. He had made some uh, kind of offhanded comments about, or offhand, you know, sort of like uh, asides about about Kurzweil and you know his quest for immortality. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I want to yeah. check that out. So I, I I got into it, and then I I learned about AI largely through the transhumanist uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, you know movement and its and its hopes and so forth. Yeah, tell us so, what that is. Well, sure, I. I yeah, so essentially transhumanists believe, whether materialists, uh, generally speaking, although there's a kind of interesting phenomenon going on with uh, proto-panpsychism, which is mm -hmm, maybe yep. something to think, think about. Yeah. But, um, w you know, when you get get into it, uh, you discover that um, essentially, you know, because these guys are materialists, because they're kind of techno-utopians, um, they believe that every problem is an engineering problem, including death. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when it comes to this, uh, you know, we just need to kind of kind of hack the machine, figure out how to extend life indefinitely, uh, yep. do it through upgrades, you know, both <laughs> uh, genetically uh, and technologically uh, through maybe, you know, you know, hardwiring uh, human beings to uh, AI, that kind of stuff. Um, really, it's the Ubermensch kind of stuff. Yep. You know, it's 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 about um you know, kind of the apotheosis of, of human beings. That's and, right. I think that's right. Yep. Yeah. And so that, that, that intrigued me. So I, I've been reading more and more about AI, just generally speaking, kind of thinking and you know, come to learn a little bit about it, where it is and current kind of its development. Of course, it's kind of become a, 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 a subject of sort of broader conversation now that, you know, chat GBT and all this kind of yeah. stuff is now uh, accessible to people. 
I I, I kind of liken it to kind of we're at the uh, radium toys uh, phase <laughs> yeah. of AI. You remember in the early fifties, you know, you could buy toys with with actual radium in it, you know, mm. and people wonder why am I sick? <laughs> yeah, you know, well, they had, and for a while they had those those watch faces that glow in the dark. Yeah, and all of yeah. the factory workers who made those, they were dipping it in that radioactive ink and they'd paint it and they'd lick the brush and do it again. <laughs> they all got mouth cancer for making those watches. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're kind of at that phase of things, I believe. <laughs> we don't know what we're messing with and, yep. we, and we're kind of, you know, kind of taken with, you know, generative AI and it being able to help you cheat on your homework and, yeah. and stuff like that. And everybody's kind of thrilled with, with, when it comes to that. But I don't think we have... Now, there are people who are very sober about the prospects. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, some of the people who are responsible for giving it to us who have said, you know, hold, hold on, slow down. Yeah, yeah I think know, Elon uh, Musk said a couple of years ago that he, he stays awake at night thinking about AI destroying us. So it's that big right. of an issue for him. Yeah, when you, and when you read, so I, one of the frustrating things I've experienced is anyway, uh, basically tech guys who maybe are mid-level uh, sort of uh, – I guess uh, information officers at say a small or medium sized company, they're they're just like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just software. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. the guys who actually know something about it are the guys yeah. that I'm getting alarmed by. It's not it's yep. not just because I'm some kind of a luddite or something. <laughs> oh yeah, yep. Uh, but anyway, so uh, we're already seeing some of its negative effects. Uh, the Chinese are tracking, uh, using AI to track Christians in China. That's uh, uh, you know not. Uh, a baseless uh, accusation. Yeah, what's that called? A social merit system, right? Right. Yep. Right. And so they're they're completely, uh, you know, unashamed to use it uh, yep. on people. But and it's also, good to know, just to warn everybody, that it doesn't come out. They don't. They don't. Maybe China does, but a Western government won't probably say, "Hey, we're going to track Christians," but they'll say, "Well, this is for your social merit score that helps you with your taxes or something. You get two percent off on your taxes if you do a good job." Yeah, well, that I think we're already seeing that. I, I read uh, that the IRS has been accused of using AI to track uh, people, um, people that they suspect maybe being chat tax cheats. But based based on kind of the performance of um, the IRS over the last uh, yeah. decade, I'm, I'm I, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's it's that kind of stuff. So you know, when we think about what we have now, this is sort of uh, you know AI 1.0 or 2.0 what they refer to as narrow AI the you know, that is really good at learning. And that's the other thing about it. You know, AI learns. That's the thing yeah. that I think, again, is a surprise to people. Uh, learns, uh, you know, uh, something in a, in a kind of a narrow range of, of uh, activity or, or sort of a, a, it has a goal within a kind of uh, pr set of parameters. So like, you know, human beings can't beat, uh, AI at Go anymore, you know, Go, you know, yeah, AI. Right. And so You posted just, about that, that a really intuitive move the AI right. made then won the game way down the road. Yeah, yeah. So it knew its opponent, his opponent, its opponent well enough to, to kind of have a good sense of what the response would be. And it was thinking 50 moves out. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that kind of smarts is scary. And, but it's still in sort of this narrow uh, range. Uh, what the Holy Grail is AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. And that's what the stuff of science fiction movies is made of. You know, yeah, tell us about that. Well, basically where it can be, can, you, you have an ability, you have intelligence across multiple domains. So that when you think about like human beings, that's what we have. So, you know, we can learn to do just about anything that we apply ourselves to. Uh, maybe not uh, to the degree that say, AI can learn in a particular sort of area uh, and far exceed our abilities when it comes to math or, yeah. you know, games or whatever. But uh, so human beings have a general intelligence and can do a number of things well. And that's what the, that's what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. So initially the goal is to have artificial general intelligence at about a, uh, you know, 100 IQ, which is the average you know, supposedly, but then the, I stop there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The step beyond that is uh, artificial super intelligence, mm -hmm. and which is, you know, intelligence across multiple domains. And um, 
uh, combining that with kind of the quest to create an internet of things, in other words, kind of digitize the world mm -hmm. and make it subject to, you know, control by digital mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at first it's like, you know, your coffee maker, you know, and your, yeah. your refrigerator, yep. but uh, they're talking about you and me now, you know, <laughs> in other words, essentially uh, having a digital uh, sort of uh, uh, interface or way to, to, to sort of, uh, uh, have access to you and me. And, and I think part, partly it's due to, uh, the fact that, uh, all the data it works with, you know, AI works with right now has already been kind of processed through human intelligence and then, yeah. you know, put into uh digital form. Yeah. What, what I think that the, they aspire to many of these AI people is direct access with the world through us. Mm -hmm. So to gain sort of an ongoing sort of stream of information that allows AI to really kind of be omniscient. That, I yeah. think that's the, that's the, that's the dream. So, yeah. At least, at least, yeah. With respect to humans, it would know what we're all doing and see through. So we have our, our cell phones now and Apple watches and hypothetically, I like Apple says they're pretty good about security, but Apple watch keeps track of your heart rate. So you could have access to Owen Anderson's heart rate over the last however many years and it'll go from there to even more information. Yeah. And I even think that the, the dream is that it will see through our eyes. It'll feel mm -hmm. through our hands. It'll just kind of experience the world in, in an embodied way. And I think that's one of the things that they've really kind of caught on to is that general intelligence is embodied intelligence. Interesting, yeah. So uh, that, you know, in order to get access to, you know, the world and it, it needs us to kind of do that. Yeah. Then that, that's sort of like the Neuralink that Musk is yeah. working on. It was, that's a, right. that's a step towards that. Yeah. And this isn't the only company. There's another called a uh, company called Synchron, which is uh, uh, not generally uh, known because of it. Most of its work seems to be DARPA kind of stuff. But, yeah. Interesting. That's a, that's a yeah. whole different question is what, <laughs> right. what are they involved right. in? Right. Yeah. Super soldier is what I think uh, partly it is, but yep. uh, yeah, I, I think um, uh, so it's, it's just uh, kind of wild that science fiction authors have been warning about us about this. Oh yeah. I was about to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. The literature the downside... just never goes well. I'm trying to think of one case where it goes well, whether it's the original Star Trek, Kirk meets a, a computer that he, it's taken over and taken away freedom from people because it realizes freedom, they use their freedom poorly. Or you have the, the new generation, the next generation, they have the Borg, which sounds just like what you're describing, where you have <laughs> lots of different individuals, but a centralized computer, yeah. right? And then you've got, of course, Terminator, which right. uh, sounds a lot like this as well. I might, you know, I'm going to be unplugged, so I'm going to take over. And then uh, yeah. recently Ultron on the Avengers, who who's oh, okay. programmed to make to help humans that's the the essence of ultron but when ultron becomes conscious it quickly scans world history and it realizes if i'm going to protect humans i have to destroy most of them because they're, their, right. own, they're their own worst enemy so he sets out yeah. to destroy most of humanity well thank you thank you for your your love for humanity ultron. yeah <laughs> right <laughs> but, but again and again you know in the like dune dune is a, yep, you know, yeah, a post story that's told about post ai and that's a fascinating um you know, sort of uh, exercise in, in uh, world building, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Frank Herbert, who had a kind of ecological consciousness, sort of a concern yeah. for ecology. Uh, he he realizes or sort of uh, in the story, the way it unfolds is uh, AI um, uh, and thinking machines uh, come to the pl point where they've just so, uh, I, I guess, uh, at, you know, human ability has atrophied so much because of the reliance upon yeah. uh, technology that, you know, human beings are es essentially enslaved. Yeah. And there's a jihad. And I think that that's the thing that's interesting about about Herbert is that he knew that or uh, he intuited that religion would be the only force yeah. strong enough. To and it, yeah, that's one of the only sci fi's where it doesn't fall off like a vestigial organ. Uh, right. Star Trek, there's really not any religion in the Federation. Right. But with, yeah, with him, it's a really important part of the future. Right. Yeah. And so the Butlerian Jihad, which is actually the term, the name Butlerian Jihad actually comes from Samuel Butler, who was a 19th mm -hmm. century um, uh, New Zealander, if, if I remember correctly, who was a, a novelist who 
uh, essentially called for a war on the machines. He's, he's more or less anticipated what we're seeing. Yeah. And so Herbert was aware of him and named the jihad for him, <laughs> which is kind of fun too. Yeah, that's but you know, you, you, yeah. Then you think about Hal, you know, 9,000 yeah. in, yep. in 2001. And it's like, uh, but it, uh, apparently, uh, their warnings are just falling on deaf ears. It's almost yeah. like these guys are inspired by, uh, well, know. that's a great question I want to get into with you is the, the motivation here, because it does sound the thing you just described about being embodied sounds demonic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it sounds like some might say it's old fashioned demon possession. And, and, and even for someone who doesn't necessarily believe in demons, they maybe think of demons just as a symbol. This mm -hmm. sounds like that. Yeah, I think possession is the thing I'm most worried about uh, in some sense. You know, so I've been reflecting a little bit on, on techno-utopian kind of uh, think characteristics, you know, what the things that characterize a techno-utopian. I think one of the things I noted is that everything's an engineering problem. Another thing is that uh, they believe knowledge is power. They don't understand that knowledge can serve other purposes than, uh, you know, dominion over the physical world, you know, yeah. like when we say, I know my wife or I know God. <laughs> In fact, with, with, when it comes to that, you know, theological knowledge, the more, you know, the more subject you actually consciously are, mm -hmm. you know, to God, you know, you, you're always su subject to God, but you, but you know, the whole process of growing in, in knowledge in, in a grace, when it comes to really Christianity or Islam or, or Judaism, it's all about, uh, recognizing your dependence upon God and yeah. submitting to God. So, um, but of course that's anathema. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something much more like what you see with Babel, you know, sort of an, yeah. uh, the apotheosis stuff. Yeah. I want so, to come back to that too. I'll make, to keep a marker in our mind. Cause I really, I think you're right on about becoming gods. And I want to talk about that too. So sorry, go ahead. No, but I think one of the things that they're naive about is they believe that uh, technology merely amplifies your power. It doesn't subject you to some system of, uh, you know, um, meaning and control. Good, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, is just, oh, it seems to be a big surprise to people is that our phones are keeping track of stuff and selling, you know, and companies are selling information yeah. about us all the time. Yep. Um, so there's, you know, there's a sense in which we're giving, we're giving uh, so much away already um, why can't these techno utopians sort of intuit that, you know, this is not a free lunch. There is, yeah. It's not just a way to amplify your, your, you know, you know, your powers, uh, to achieve your own personal goals. There's, yeah. there's somebody else who's, who's got an agenda that's being pursued through you. Yeah. And so the idea of, you know, the internet of things, uh, and the fact that, or at least the suspicion that I have that, <laughs> That in order for AI to achieve general, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, it's going to require access to the world through an embodied state. Yeah. Uh, and and robotics won't be able to pull off what needs to be done. I think that, and so it does kind of effectively lend itself to a kind of technological possession. Yeah, that does parallel, parallel a demonic possession. Yeah. Yeah, and especially if that, I mean, e either way, it sounds horrible, but especially if that is that. Possession is motivated by falsehood, anti-Christian uh, belief system, right? And then it's really a nightmare. I mean, and that's the thing for me is it, I don't know if Brave New World really counts as sci-fi. I guess it kind of is. But that's the kind of book I think about that comes to mind for this, which mm -hmm. is a world that attempted to have a utopia but didn't really understand human nature and thought yeah. that humans are basically good. And mm -hmm. so I wonder if, if that's some of the beliefs we, we maybe can identify some of the beliefs going on here. And one of them might be humans are basically good. And our, uh, when we're when we're bad, when we're evil, it's only environmental. And mm -hmm. so that goes to your point, which is that can be engineered out of us. Right. And right. So I think it's connected to the point you made at first about wokeism, because that's what wokeism teaches. Also, that's what Harvard and other schools have been teaching for a while is that humans are perfectible natural evil can be taken away old age sickness death toil strife famine war all these things that come under what is in the curse in genesis 3 all right. those are our real problem and, and so really it's a kind of attempt to get into eden again without redemption right get yeah, rid of the I, curse yeah i think that's right you know vogelin's uh at, you know admonition don't try to amenitize the eschaton mm -hmm. normally when, when when people bring that up we think about marxism and yeah. um and, and i think it's an appropriate 
uh, application of what he's getting. I think I see what he was actually thinking about. But yeah. uh, that's kind of a, a kingdom of God without without God. Uh, I think transhumanism is a glorified body without uh, yep. God. You know, so, well, that's what Plato said. He said if immortality without the good would be a curse. Right. And so with these guys who want to live forever, I, I kind of want to ask them, and, and to do what? What will you do? Yeah. I mean, what, what's your, because I, I think ultimately with the resurrection, we will live forever, but right. it matters if you're in the, if you're a believer or unbeliever and it'll affect what you do. So even now the, the kind of visions that I hear are still very hedonistic. So I want yeah, to do I, suffering to live forever, to, to enjoy myself. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and in an odd way, uh, what they've done is they've taken Christianity and taken Christ out, mm -hmm. but this, but kind of the, the, the frame of reference in terms of, you know, kind of um, the heavenly calling in terms of a uh, society, you know, that's uh, harmonious, you know, yeah. and, and uh, cooperative and one cares um, about the poor and the weak. Yeah. And then the other thing is, of course, you know, the glorification of the body, you know, there is a, um, you know, that is the promise of the resurrection is that, you know, things will be different. Um, and, uh, we will uh, enjoy victory over death itself. You know, so yep. death is the last enemy. So, and I and I've actually come across uh, some writers who say they're Christian who just more or less maintain that the means by which mm -hmm. uh, this heavenly vision is to be um, achieved is you know technical in character, yeah. and that this is what you know the Bible had in mind all along. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder do they do they have any solutions for sin though? So technology yeah. helps us with, with, you know, maybe suffer. I'm not hungry as much because of agricultural revolution and we have good health care. But then that's that's brave new world. My life is completely empty. And so the yeah. government has to supply me with free drugs to keep me going. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think Huxley's vision in, in Brave New World is more appropriate for the, for the time we find her. So yeah, we, we use, you know, 1984 yeah. as kind of a foil. It was a great, you know, club to beat uh communist mm -hmm. with <laughs> yeah but it didn't really examine us whereas yeah. i think brave new world is much more an examination of the west yeah and it's more subtle in the sense that yeah. the police state of 1984 you know it's there whereas mm -hmm. the people in brave new world aren't even aware of how they're being manipulated because they're happy that's right or at least sedated enough to yeah. think that yeah, happy, superficial right? happiness yep right right well yeah, yeah. One of the things I noticed with the AI guys is there's also a close connection. The AI guys, the immortality guys, and then the third group is the alien guys. Hmm. And a lot of them, those three seem to overlap. And sometimes you'll get explicit claims by the first two groups that they're getting this information from aliens. Have you run across that at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff uh, that, you know, kind of in the, the kind of the nether regions of this uh, literature mm -hmm. get gets at that kind of thing. Uh I haven't done anything with it just because uh, it's one of those things where I'm not sure what to do with it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, you know, how do I substantiate it? But, you know, I, you know, I spent my childhood in Scientology. My father was a Scientologist. Really? Okay. My, yeah. So I was born in, uh, into an Episcopalian home and was okay. baptized Episcopalian, but my father was an academic and my mother was kind of a lefty. Mm -hmm. And so uh, by the time I was five or six, my folks were in Scientology. In so what this interested? Kind of, what? How did that conversion happen? Well, I think it's the techno gnosticism of it. Okay. Um, uh, now it's a little bit crude, and uh, you know when we look at it now, and mm -hmm. almost kind of laughable when you when you know you act, yeah. actually get into some of the esoteric writings of, of L. Ron Hubbard. But he didn't make you, you know, uh, he didn't reveal what he was up to right. You know, at the, right, at the yep. start, he just kept. <laughs> further you get in, the more you learn, and that kind of thing. And at some, and for some people, that was actually the point where they said, "This is not some out of here." <laughs> We got that. But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. But anyway, oh, cool. so I've got a kind of, um, I guess, a personal kind of uh, animus toward techno gnostic, uh, probably because of that. Anything Can they stay in smacks it? Of it. Uh, my my mother's uh, gone. She's been she she died in the early nineties, uh, but my father's still uh, involved at that, and he lives in Clearwater, Florida, which is kind okay. of like now their their know, air for, their naval air force sort of thing. Well, it's the Benedict option for Scientologists. Yeah. Uh, if, if Clearwater, Florida is where they all hang out now. Okay. So he must be pretty high up in whatever way they measure themselves, right? I guess so. Yeah. You know, we're we're not interacting, you know, so. Okay. Uh, but 
Uh, yeah, it's one thing yeah, I tell I, people, I, if you were to meet Tom Cruise and you were to say to Tom Cruise, are you a super agent who saved the world multiple times from the brink of disaster? He'd say, no, I'm just an actor. Of course, that's not real. If you were to say, are you a six million year old alien who's going to protect us from frozen right. aliens? He'd say, yeah, that's what I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, 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 the, and the rest of us, too, you know, we just don't know it. You know, <laughs> that's where this Gnostic element, you know. Yeah, like, right. So how did but, you come uh, out of that? You're raising it. Well, well, my my father uh, left our family when I was 11, and so uh, I ended up uh, as a I became a ward of the state. Uh, yeah, you know, shortly after that. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was it was during those years that I met a preacher's kid. We became best friends, and I got oh. involved in a, a whole different kind of world. I mean, wow. so the the world of my childhood was made up of uh, Scientologists and kind of mm -hmm. Bohemian and esoteric people that you find in sort of the campus uh yes you know you know what i'm talking about yeah yep. <laughs> uh, wow. but then i found myself in like blue collar america in western pennsylvania with kind of just meat and potatoes salt of the earth people who were able to work on their own cars and wow. you know, take care of their families and so i i i i, I in god's providence uh I found myself in a much better place yeah well yeah thank the lord for that landing yeah. and then in, you went you obviously ended up with an mdiv from harvard so well, you, I didn't actually finish at Harvard. I, I was I already had a master's before I went there, but I was teaching. Um, this is a kind of a fun story. Yeah. So I dropped out. But uh, what happened was, um, do you remember Harvey Cox? Yeah. Does that name yeah. Bell? Sec Secular City. Anyway, um, I I was invited to a, a class that he was conducting on evangelicalism. And I was there with a couple of other guys. And um it was, you know, it's like almost like uh, you're um, a strange creature from a, from some mm -hmm. other continent. You know, they brought you in to, to talk to learn a little about you. So anyway, but it, it was like total war for an hour and a half. Just wow. to, you know, we were going at it, and then afterwards, uh, uh, Dr. Cox asked me to be to come to Harvard. So that's wow. how I ended up there. So, but I was teaching philosophy at that time, and and was uh, you know looking at moving on to get my uh, a PhD. I don't have teaching? one. Uh, I was teaching at Eastern Nazarene College on the oh, South Shore. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it closed down here not too long ago. Um, but uh, so I taught there. And um, anyway, so I was I was uh, kind of in this place where I wasn't sure whether my future was uh, in the academy or not. And so it was during that period of time that I was at uh, the Divinity School there. Yeah. And it was a very valuable experience for me. I came away from it with, um, you know, it's like a gauntlet. You know, if you can go through the gauntlet, yeah. you know, you know, your intellectual like adversaries get to throw everything at you that they have. Mm -hmm. And then if you're like, OK, well, if that's all you got, I, I think I'm OK. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was it was a it was a good experience uh, in uh, in that sense for me. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't finish just because I, I wasn't going to pursue a, a Ph.D. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a similar kind of the Harvey Cox experience you had with. John Hick, who was a philosopher. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. Hick. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had dinner with him. And he when he was older, I was in England for a conference. I met him for, in Birmingham. And he brought his daughter, who was his caretaker. And so Hick started, we started talking philosophy stuff. And just at the end of his life, he'd been an ordained minister, Presbyterian his whole life. He was at the very end of his life, finally becoming a Quaker, which is much more consistent. I can't believe the Presbyterians <laughs> kept him around that long. Right, um, right. But so then he and I started talking some theology. And his daughter perked up and said wait a minute you believe in the virgin birth and it was like she was seeing a rare exotic animal at the zoo or something like <laughs> it's the 20th right. this was this was probably 21st century just barely in the 2000s yeah. it's 2000 how can you possibly do you believe jesus like rose from the dead and she started asking me these yeah is the bible inspired and and she just couldn't yeah. believe that i was an yeah. academic person yeah living in our time and believe those things yeah. Well, I, I've had many conversations like that, as you yeah. can imagine. I remember one time I was walking across Harvard Yard with my my primary professor, who was uh, Harvey, uh, you know, it was Ralph Potter. Uh, and so we were going across the, and he was a, you know, a liberal Presbyterian. And he, and he was, he liked me and uh, he would have been my, you know, uh, my doctoral father if I had, you know, continued, but he was testing me and uh, he had made some jokes about the resurrection. And I, you know, I, didn't laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I told him, no, I, I really believe in the resurrection. Yeah. And uh, I knew my, I knew in one sense that I had one strike against me at that moment. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, I just met somebody who had been um, looking into Princeton theological, yeah, and they were evangelical, and they got up to the final interview, and they hadn't they they had their CV and their their essay, but they hadn't talked personally about being evangelical on either one of those. And so they, in the interview, they said to me, "I can tell they were trying to figure out am I an evangelical," and they eventually just said, "Are you an evangelical?" And I said, "Yes," and they said, "Well, we're we're not going to be able to accept you then because you won't agree with anything we're saying." And you'll leave here not teaching what we want you to teach. So I was like, man, that's it's pretty bad. Yeah. But that yeah, yeah. that came up because your point about Harvard and about thought leaders, where's the the public is only seeing the very beginning of that now with AI. Right. And so, so I think one of the connections that I'm that I make, and you've used the word gnostic, but between the AI guys, the immortality guys, and the alien guys is that thing called the new age movement. Right. And that seems to have infiltrated all of those intellectuals in one way or another. And it teaches that apotheosis, that ultimately our goal is to become divine beings. And right. so for the materialist, that means these super aliens that come down, we're, we're meant to be with them and be like them. Or for the, yeah. the, the engineer, maybe a computer. But it's that same idea of you could become divine. Yeah. Well, and certainly you see that in Scientology with kind of becoming an operating thate and the OT and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think uh, I think that's right. Uh, so, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, as they say. And so people, you know, we can't have a vacuum of meaning. There has to be some kind of yeah. frame or framework to uh, get, make our lives, uh, you know, to direct our lives and so that they're meaningful. And yeah. uh, so I think that that's right. I think that uh, various... I guess permutations of of new age thought have kind of uh, filled the gap. Um, yeah, I, I, it'd be interesting to kind of look at it, maybe a, you know a taxonomy of all the different. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I there were there were books like that, uh, but uh, I haven't seen anything recently. Yeah, it's almost like there was one version of it that a lot of apologetics guys attacked in the eighties and early nineties, right. and maybe they had some victory over it. But yeah. then there's this other version that's stuck around and is yeah. maybe more insidious. Yeah, that's a good point. I, yeah, I haven't given too much thought to the relationship between um, the New Age movement and and this. But when you think about it, like Kurzweil, Kurzweil is a is kind of the evangelist for the transhumanist movement, and you know he's ethnically Jewish, but he grew up uh, universalist. He was mm -hmm. raised in, a, which is like uh, perfect uh, yep. <laughs> for kind of, kind of, you know, you know, it, it, you say uh, it's, you know, of course, <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, there, there's, um, so he's, he's, um, he's kind of acting out a lot of things along a, a kind of, kind of pre a, a predictable trajectory. Yep. No, I think that's true. And I have never been around the level of a Musk or even the tier below him, but I've been around some people maybe at another tier that are involved in Silicon Valley type things or major businesses. And they all have like a personal meditation coach and yeah. their goal is inner peace, which is they mean in a Buddhist sense right. and their homes are decorated with Buddhas. So it's not as if they hide that. Uh, I think it's a really superficial understanding of those religions. I think that after World War II, the Eastern religions did a really good job of marketing themselves to the West yeah. Yeah. because they basically said Christianity gave you the world wars. We're mm -hmm. religions of peace. And if anybody mm -hmm. knows the history of the East, you know Buddhism is not a religion of peace. Hinduism is not a religion of peace. Shinto right, is not. Right. Right? But, but if you talk to any college student today, which religions want peace, right. they'll say, well, Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, and so it seems to have been a very attractive and, and very useful marketing ploy that has now yeah. infused itself into many of our leaders, especially in, in the business world, who are yeah. in charge of these kinds of projects. And it's interesting how it's kind of disconnected uh, from any kind of uh, organized effort. You know, mm -hmm. during the during the 70s and 80s, you remember Hare Krishna and, and just yeah, different yeah. and and all of that stuff um, eventually uh, was kind of. Uh, well, revealed to be, um, you know, as you know, to marketing, but also uh, uh, wealth uh, generating. Yep. Yeah, that's the thing. For, that's what's so funny guys. about it. <laughs> right. So you had a all dream these... song about with Lenin when he owns his own private island. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. But now, because you don't have some institution, you know, it just kind of continues to exist kind of in this 
ethereal kind of uh, kind of uh, ethos uh, that kind of is p kind of part of Silicon Valley culture, yeah. I guess, or California culture or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, California culture is a good way to put it, too, because that's just sort of the right. assumption. I think that's the closest they get to dealing with sin is they deal with one of the effects of sin, which is that we're not at peace inside. We have pangs of conscience and we have anxiety and right. depression. And right. so rather than say, well, yeah, that's a natural response to sin, they'll say, right. well, then you can keep your lifestyle, but do these practices and you'll feel a little better. Yeah, I think that's a great way to, to describe what's going on. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, like when it comes to um, what to make of all that, I think that's probably the best way to sum it up. Yeah, and well, that kind of use that to transition then to one of the other topics that I think you you really post some great information about is basically just call it how to be a man, and I called it dad advice earlier. Um, you mentioned blue collar, and are you involved in that blue collar conference coming up? Yeah, I've been involved with, uh, there was something called the Blue Collar Confessionalism. That's what uh, it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I spoke at uh, one of the conferences, uh, but I've had a kind of a background yeah. in the trades, and uh, my interest uh, in working with the, your hands is really something I can trace back to my time in Western Pennsylvania as a teenager when I got to know those those guys that I did. Yeah, sometimes you'll post on with. Facebook something where you like, Hey, my Saturday was I built this whole patio, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, oh, <laughs> I raked up some some sticks in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I it, it, when I was in my first graduate program, um, I um, was uh, initially hired by my wife's uncle, who was a uh, commercial contractor in Kansas City, steel and concrete, and then I went into business with a bunch of other guys who were seminary guys we had a we had a, a deck building company and at that time in the Kansas City area you know all the farms or a lot of the farms in Olathe were being um, turned into subdivisions and we just go in and knock out wow. these wonderful cedar decks uh, it was a marvelous uh, period of time in my life and then I've stayed in I've stayed in, uh, connected to the trades mainly through the properties that I own and have helped to renovate you know I've flipped houses I've I've owned apartment buildings and stuff, and yeah. but I also was a um, a contractor for a brief period of time, and I've so I've got yeah you know maybe about I don't know five six years of full time experience in the, in, in building trades. Yeah, that's great. I mean, what how does that translate? Let's say into advice for young men. What do you notice now compared to maybe when you were younger? Or you mentioned your grandfather. So when your sons were younger, and then you now, what do young men need? Well, I think uh, you know. Uh, of course, we want them to develop intellectually, uh, and uh, there's the life of the mind. But I think there needs to be an engagement with the physical world, and, and not just to become a, a well balanced person, but just because I think that you learn things that way that you can't learn otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, my, my conviction is that uh, one of the reasons why we have so much sort of silliness re related to, say, transgenderism is, is people don't actually in interact with the physical word, world yeah. very much. They just are interacting with pixels online. And yeah. you can make pixels do anything you want or appear to do things, uh, yeah. you know, but it's all virtual and it's virtual yeah. reality, right? Mm -hmm. But when you actually engage with the physical world, you realize, well, okay, well, yeah. you know, it, it kind of there's kind of a design already in place, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you work with it. So yeah, and you got to figure it out and learn how to manipulate it. And I don't mean in a bad sense, but a good sense of yeah. how to work with wood. There's, I remember one time when I was in my undergraduate years, I did some construction, also roofing, and my oh, yeah. uh, my foreman said, "Hey, go to the uh, truck and bring me my uh, two by four extender." I was like, oh, truck. I'm looking for this thing. Like, where is that? I can't find this thing. Where, where is that? And he's like, yeah, the two by four is too short. You got to find that extender. We won't be able to finish this. <laughs> but yeah, you can't do that. You can't extend wood. This is where That's it's right. at. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He was having a little fun with you, obviously. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Brad, you make fun of you guys. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's another the place I experienced that. I'm a jujitsu instructor, and I oh yeah, in jujitsu because there's this great on you know the onion the comedy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, have this great yeah. like two minute thing. They do these fake news reports. So it's like a, right. a news report. And it's about how men overestimate their fighting ability by a factor of 40. 
So <laughs> interviews men about how they all think they could beat the other guy up. Like, well, if he right. got into it, I just punch him in the face and then elbow him. Right. And when right. you actually start rolling with someone, you realize I can't really do what I want to do right now. I'm stuck. And yeah. I got to learn the right angle, yeah. the right posture to get to oh, where yeah. I go. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. Now, I don't have any any uh, you know personal experience with jujitsu or even you know physical mar martial arts, but uh, just the fact that you know I've been working with my hands, it's just mm -hmm. so yeah. obvious. Yeah, so, you know, it's intuitive. You just say, okay, wow. And so I have a great deal of admiration for guys who have those skills. Um, and like anything, it takes time. It takes uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you obviously you've invested. Yeah, <clears throat> yourself it's one of the slow in, ones in too. Jujitsu is a very few belts. So it's very slow, but yeah, one of the, one time I laughed because I asked my high one of my boys, what are you doing? He's well, I'm playing Roblox. What do you do on Roblox? And it was something like I'm cleaning up my room or something. And I was like, wait a minute, you're on a computer game, cleaning up your room or doing yard work. There's a real yard out back that you can go clean up for me. Right. right. And yeah, so it gets to this I, absurdity point where you're not even doing normal things in the world. Right. Well, this gets to, uh, back to my, my sons. I, I, uh, my oldest son, Back in the days when Guitar Hero was a thing, I don't know if you remember that yeah. that oh, video yeah. game where you could like play air guitar and sound yeah. like you know you were in like ACDC or something. <laughs> yeah, I never played <laughs> anyway, it, but it was really popular. Yeah. Oh yeah. So my son, uh, he he observed this and he said, "Why do that? Would you can just you can just yeah. learn the guitar." Yeah. So he did. So I bought him a guitar. You know, I bought him an inexpensive one. I said, "When you can demonstrate that this is something that you're really interested in, I'll buy you something better." Good. And then eventually, he, he you know he got to to the point where he was so into it, he was buying his own stuff. And yeah, and now he's an accomplished musician that lives in Nashville. Uh, but well, there's guys who might win a air guitar co competition. What about them? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it had it just like it had instead of the buttons on the controller, it had them on the 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 neck of Correct. the guitar. And so you just push those same buttons like this. So maybe it would be like beginner level one of dexterity, but then you're right. Why not actually just learn to play these notes? All right. Yeah. yeah. So that's what he did. My so second son, Nick. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so get young men doing things with their hands, getting out in the yeah. world. Yeah. So my second son is a welder. He's actually a foreman for a steel firm in, in the Hartford area. And he's, he's, he's going to be 28 but he already oversees 30 guys wow. many of whom are older than him but he's really good i mean he he actually did what ron swanson did when that yeah. episode when ron swanson made the rings remember yeah. they they lost their wedding well my son made the wedding rings wow. that he and his I wife think wear post those, yeah yeah but anyway it's just so he uh again that was kind of the thing you know I, I, he just and now uh you know he's built his own forges he's he's uh renovated you know mill, milling machines and different things yeah. he's building out his shop he's able to do just That's excellent marvelous stuff um you know far beyond my my abilities um but well uh, and i you know i saw a statistic the other day about it was for christian universities but i think this is mimicked in state universities it was the percentage difference of men and women in universities and it's quite right. high women really outnumber men at a number of notable christian universities I think yeah. uh, like, like Seattle Pacific might have been like 79% or something women. Um, so that's also seen not not quite that stark. I think we're probably like 57% women uh, at ASU. But it's still notable that men are saying this doesn't seem to be the path I want to go. And of yeah. course, the people I work with will say, well, that's because they have toxic masculinity or they haven't been socialized correctly or they don't understand how to get a high paying job or they have no discipline. They don't want to listen to us, but I don't think that's what it is. No, no. I think it's a, I think it's actually a healthy sign. Um, so let me give you my take on it. So I've been a landlord for years and uh, I've seen a lot of credit reports because of, you know, I've had about 80 tenants over the years. And so I've probably seen, I don't know, 10 times the number of credit reports. That's yeah. obviously an exaggeration, yeah. but you know, I'm getting, I understand, getting yeah. but, it, but uh, generally speaking, the women are in really bad shape financially who oh, apply really? to, oh. to rent for me. Yeah. And often it's because of all the student loan that, that really? they, wow. they carry. So I, I think that they're being conned. I think that the women in our society are being uh, pers are kind of forced into this. So the reason is, is because, uh, many of the of the professions that they're interested in, uh, you know, require them to have a degree, but come with a very strong cap on what you're actually going to actually earn in life. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, so like education and healthcare for yep. unless you're like a, 
uh, a, you know, a doctor who yep. specializes in a very uh, lucrative, you know, form of medicine, uh, you're probably going to be kind of locked in um, as a nurse or, you know, a yeah. nurse's aide or practitioner. And then same thing with, so for example, I would see uh, women with credit scores in the low 600s mm. uh, and they were carrying, you know, 70, 80, $90,000 of debt and they're just out of school yeah. and they've got a, a brand new car that they're driving around because they're afraid that if, if it breaks down, you know, they're not going to be able to, to deal yeah. with that. So, so uh, all of my tenants right now are guys. And the reason is, is because their credit scores are better and they actually pay on time. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and many of them are, are guys who work with their hands. And so I, you know, it's not, not, the only thing I use to screen is the credit report. Yeah. Uh, it's not as though I was trying to pick on anybody. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I would like to see another level of analysis with the enrollment. So, yeah, we're talking about large numbers, you know, like 60 to 40%. But what are the girls studying? Yeah. What are their I'd prospects? Be good too, because I think I've, I've, you've probably seen I've been posting arguments about problems at ASU. And mm -hmm. today's was about gender studies specifically that it teaches really terrible sex philosophy, which is yeah. going to harm people, even just from a health perspective, even if you don't care about your moral character. From a health perspective, this is terrible. But then the gender studies degrees themselves, the first ASU webpage for them and a list jobs you can get. And the first one is you can be an advocate. And essentially <laughs> so you make like 32,000. Yeah. Right, like, right. It wasn't right, ad right. advocate. What on earth is that? It's not, it's not, it doesn't mean lawyer. Uh, it just right. means you're a person yeah. who says, I know things. And so I'm going to go to protests and, right. and speak my mind. And, th and then the second one is you could be a gender studies professor. So it's just this self-replicating. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, no right. actual useful job for a gender study. Right. Yeah, and and you know, we've both seen this the sad sort of uh, outcome of, of this sort of uh, you know um, subject matter and and what it produces, particularly women. They, you know, just a lot of unhealthy, you know, physically unhealthy, mentally unhealthy uh, people. It's just well, really, yeah, anxiety. Really terrible. You know, universities complain anxiety and depression are through the roof for their students. Right. But then the solutions they offer them is to hate each other because yep. the guy next to you, he's white and he got mm -hmm. benefits you didn't get. So you should hate him or hate males. Mm -hmm. And so the solution is to create more anxiety among their students. They don't have any right. solution. Maybe the other one is, is some kind of prescription, but they don't yeah. have any cognitive solution to say, here's how to make sense of your life. Well, and two, it creates a kind of dependency upon the, kind of the uh, administrative state, the welfare state in particular. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we see such strong support among women for, um, you know, uh, kind of the pro progressive political program. Yeah, well, yeah, the vote, the record on that is amazing. And it's all when you hear the younger women talk, usually they're either in university or they've graduated university, it's all they're concerned about reproductive rights. And if you ask them what they're worried about for that, it's something like, well, I'm having a miscarriage. And unless, and the baby's dead, but unless the baby's removed, I'll die too. And the doctor, Trump does not want the doctor to be allowed to remove the dead baby. So it's all some falsehood that is not real, yeah. but their professor told yeah. them that. I, I posted about this last month. We had a, an event at ASU where two feminist professors, ASU professors told the students in the audience, if you don't vote for Harris and Trump wins, you'll be imprisoned and forced to breed. And it's just like the weirdest <laughs> thing, like... But I guarantee there's students who left thinking, yeah, that's right. Because they've watched yeah, that is... tale or something and they thought that was a documentary, not fiction. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, and, and and of course the other kind of uh shoe that's that's been dropping on just the world generally speaking is, is the fertility crisis everywhere. We're at oh, yeah. sub replacement replacement. So I, I, I think that this thing is all kind of kind of well, it's sort of like uh, you could say things have been oversold or uh, there's been a kind of an inflationary spiral of insanity and 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 we're going to kind of get to, uh, we've got a bubble and it's going to yeah. burst. And that bubble, yeah. the thing I think that'll burst it is just kind of the reality that, wow, we can't afford these social programs anymore because yeah. you can only raise the taxes so far before, again, it becomes self-defeating or uh, you do need a, new people coming into the, to the, you know, the workforce. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to just get them from overseas yeah. forever, you know. Well, that's what's funny. Now, later. All of my, all the colleagues I work with, back with George W. Bush, 
they hated him for open immigration because they call that that kind of Republican as a Wall Street Republican who wants cheap labor. And so they hated that. But it's the same thing the Democrats are doing now. Yep. It's just and now they love it. Now they think it's the greatest thing in the world. So it's it's really strange how some of these things have flipped in one sense. Uh, my my colleagues back under George W. Bush all hated him for war, but now war is perfectly acceptable and should be encouraged. Right. So it's, it's yeah, it's it's it basically I think the thread that it follows is the big state, the state they want, and right. whatever the state they want is doing is good, and right. the opposing right. ideas are bad. But right. I think that there and there's a, the story you and I you know philosophy theology, so we care about a certain kind of education, which we know is not necessarily tied to what is currently higher ed. You probably won't even get it at higher ed, but there's this lie that's been going on starting probably after World War II, but especially implemented as as student loans picked up, which is you got to get a college degree or not. You're essentially not a good person. Right. And it's very cynical because as, as student loans are available, you'll see I've seen the graphs where student loans are available this much. Tuition goes up here. Now a right. little more student loans. Tuition goes up here. And then right. the other bar will be administrators going up. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. what we currently have is just simply not needed and it's harmful. Yeah. And, you know, the growth of the uh, adjunct faculty is sort of yeah. like, uh, you know, community where people just can't get tenure anymore. And and colleges seem to be perfectly fine with that, you know. Yeah. Tenure is really disappearing uh, in many cases. I got tenure and I know I wouldn't get it now because I'm being outspoken. but. Right. The, that the number of people we're hiring as they've changed the name too. There's, there's there's rank inflation, which means instead of calling them adjuncts, you know they bump up the name. So now they're called okay. uh, teaching professors. Okay. So you can still yeah. tell your friends you're a professor, <clears throat> Got um, it. but you're really still paid much less than that. So yeah, yeah, the whole system's built on that. I was an adjunct for a long time when I was trying to get a job. Yeah, and yeah, that's just what you, you have to have those cheap classes. But I think right, I think right. coming back, let's circle back now. I think that will be could be solved with AI because AI is at a place where it can mimic my voice, right? And probably begin to mimic the video, and it could right. have me or anybody else teaching a class and not have to pay me anything, right? Well, getting to this, uh, it's even something I think that we need to be worried about with the church. Um, there is a strange phenomenon uh, of kind of. I guess uh, they would they might refer to themselves as sort of techno optimists, but I think they're borderline techno utopians within the church, mm. and and I've kind of you know presented this this argument. Well, wh why not just have a pastor who's AI generated? Yeah. Um, you know, think about it. It's, you know, just sinless. Uh, if it's all, yeah, <laughs> don't have to worry about him run off with the secretary, do you? Yeah, <laughs> uh, but. But the other side of it is this kind of uh, disembodied character that uh, that kind of smacks of Gnosticism. Oh, yeah, it's just it's all about the information uh, sort of flow. Uh, it doesn't really matter that it came from an embodied person. Um, yeah. Just weird stuff. Well, I think that's one of my arguments about AI is that the things that we're uniquely given to do, like knowing God, becoming wise, right. the Great Commission. Right. I don't think right. these are things AI can do. It could mm -hmm. imitate them maybe, but it wouldn't be able to do them. Mm -hmm. But what if you have a society that doesn't do those things? Yeah. So you have a whole college educated group that doesn't know what wisdom is. It yeah. doesn't know God. Well, isn't that the perfect group to take over with AI? Because they right. won't object about it. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's right. Per perhaps the best, uh, well, I, I, I'm reading a book on AI right now that one of the uh, apologies for kind of a, the the post uh, work economy uh, that he made is that it'll free up time for contemplation, hmm. and I thought, my goodness, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, here we are, kind of recovering a medieval sort of monastic vision yeah. without la in la the labora part, <laughs> you know, aura and labora, yeah. you know. Um, and uh, what what becomes of say the you know the reformed doctrine of vocation and all of that? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, that worries me too, because I think that yeah. I think there's probably a root. My my suspicion as intellectual historian is that monasticism and contemplationism traces itself to Greek and Gnostic thought about the world. So the best life is one where you have leisure to just think about right. the forms, which is what you were doing before you were in the body. 
right. versus the Protestant work ethic and the command to have dominion and be involved in the world. So I know that's really attractive to some Christians. And it tend, generally, the ones I know that I work with are usually conservative Catholics. They like uh, Joseph mm-hmm. Pieper on uh, leisure and Aristotle right. on leisure. But you're right, 100%. That Well, what about dominion and work and being involved in God's world? I, I saw right. a presentation the other day where someone said that Francis, all the evils of the world could be traced to Francis Bacon. And they especially especially picked out a few quotes from him where he he says, you know, you need to crush the world to give it, make it give you its secrets, you know, to you know, destroy basically destroy nature to give it give your its secrets to you. And and I said, I think that you're kind of misunderstanding those. And it's all it's always bad to blame one person. Descartes, the other right, sure. in philosophy, everything's because of Descartes. But right. what Francis Bacon did was he said, Hey, go get involved in the world, interact with the world. The Aristotelians. Aristotle said two objects, the heavier one will fall more quickly. Right. And for 2,000 years, no one bothered themselves to go outside and drop objects and see if that's true. Right. Yeah. So what, what right. Francis Bacon told us was, no, go out there and actually be involved and experiment with the world, see what it's like. And I, I would hate to lose that in the name well, of this I, kind of Gnostic leisure. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I've got certain reservations about uh, what's become of Bacon's philosophy. Sure, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I do... Uh, I'm not um, a Luddite. I, I'm a, sure, yeah. I, th- I think of myself as sort of a techno realist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- and I do think the experimental method has given us, uh, you know, uh, a, a world that is much uh, uh, sort of more commodious <laughs> to yeah. live in. I'm, I'm all for air conditioning. I'm all for, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, like, like when I, when I saw, uh, you know, the uh, SpaceX rocket, uh, yeah, that was return to to his launch pad. I was like with everybody else. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I've seen uh, and, the ten. I've seen videos of the ten fails where it starts oh, yeah, that's right. down, goes crazy, and hits it, and they all blow up. <laughs> right. I don't want to be right. on that one. No, no. But the thing the thing about that, I was I was interacting with, or talking to somebody about uh, Elon's approach and his 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 approach to uh, progress uh, was fascinating because he said that you should have at least a forty percent fail rec- rate, uh, and if it's not uh, at least that you're not w- trying hard enough. No, okay. So he's actually encouraging his engineers yeah. to, to take risks. Yeah, I think engineers, generally speaking, are afraid of failure to the degree that they're. Oh yeah. You know, you know, they're trying to prevent anything that could go wrong. But that's, that's the right. problem. You know, the only way we're going to learn is by taking risks. That's another thing I've, I, I've been, you know, uh, thinking a lot about is the nature of risk and its importance in, in yeah. our in our lives. Yeah, that's a that's a very um, male area of life where yeah. you're willing to jump from this tree branch to that tree branch when you're you know you're right. five years old, and mom's right. around saying stop, don't do that. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But now it does seem that we've kind of said no, you don't want risk. You want the safe path to a career, which means you go to the state university, you get the degree. Um, I don't know. Actually, Rush Limbaugh did an analysis. You no, know, he's not a psychologist, but he said he thinks there's sure. something to the person who goes into a private law firm compared to the guy that gets a state job as a district attorney. And yeah. the one is the one you're saying, you know, I'm going to go into a private law firm. I might not make partner. I might get fired, but I could make a lot of money. And the other right. guy's got a guaranteed income, but you're not going to go up very high. Right. Well, and I think too, that uh, this has something to do with kind of the bureaucratic uh, frame of mind where, uh, and that when we think about the, you know, the administrative state um, it's all about, uh, risk risk mitigation yeah. and not about uh, you know uh, the virtues that you know really are much more in keeping with the traditional understanding of masculinity, which would be obviously martial in character, but also related to risk taking. I, mean, yeah. I think that risk taking is uh, you know we we don't have, none of the things that we enjoy that make the modern life so so great came about uh, without risk. Yeah. There was, there was there were people who risked money, people who risked their reputations, people who risked. And you lose, uh, sometimes their, you lose. Yeah. Or even their physical, uh, you know, well-being. You yeah. Know, you know, well, that was, you know. that was one thing when, when Trump was president first, I hadn't ever read his, his book, The Art of the Deal. And so okay. I read that and it was really stood out to me how many times he failed and how, mm. and he would say how good that was for him. And it would be, yeah. I mean, it wasn't just bankruptcies, but it would be a, ma- a major lawsuit and the, the judge ruled against him. And he, you know, he didn't just give up and quit life. He would say, yeah, sometimes you lose these because you can't control the judge and I'll try again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's right. And I think it's one of the things that makes him sort of inscrutable to the left. They just, they just don't get the guy. Yeah. And, 
so they have to kind of pigeonhole him into some category that uh you know makes him look really evil yeah yeah so the the idea about francis bacon i wonder if one thing that was lost between him and us because he and others like kepler would say I want to get out into nature and explore it to think God's thoughts after him. Right. I'm right. learning about God. Whereas right. now when you take that out and it's purely utilitarian, I just want to suffer less. That seems to give us the bad side of science that we see today. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I'm all for uh, the scientific method and uh, I'm even for uh, gaining mastery over the physical world. Um, that's not, not a, problem but i i am concerned about in the, the equation of knowledge with power yeah uh in the way that i was talking about earlier yeah, who has it uh, yeah. because it kind of closes off yeah you know, closes there's that but it also closes off uh as you know and makes uh you know subjective uh, forms of knowledge that are really really the most valuable mm. like you know knowledge of other human beings in a yeah. relational way knowledge of god yeah um Knowledge, you know, knowledge that, you know, even when we talk about something like beauty, um, it's become something that we just sort of say, well, you have your opinion, I have mine. Right. And we don't even talk about it. But if we really do have a, a, a conviction that beauty is, uh, it has some objective basis, then uh, it's going to be something we strive for. Uh, but it's not going to be necessarily something that um, gives us power in the, in the sense that right. maybe some people are looking for. Yeah, that's a good way. That that's a good analysis of the idea of power, um, sort of popularized by Nietzsche, but coming down yeah. to the present. Thrasymachus in the Republic is the same guy as Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. did. The just is whatever is powerful, right? Right, and that yeah, that's definitely um, the world of academics today. I I saw a crazy statistic that that Foucault, who they call Nietzsche's greatest disciple, Foucault has one point three million citations, which is more than like. Thomas Aquinas and Augustine. I mean, it's, I don't wow. know about those guys literally, but it's a lot, yeah. right? Jordan Peterson yeah. was bragging about having a thousand citations for an article. So yeah. Foucault is 1.3 million. It's just mind boggling because yeah. Yeah. what he says is nonsense. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy stuff. Yep. Yeah. So well, one thing um, I saw for technology is Elon Musk saying that in, in the future, instead of owning a car, you'd basically have a monthly subscription and I got to get to work at eight. So a Tesla will pull up at seven 30 driving to work. It'll go back into the center hub and charge. And I need to come home at five. So a Tesla will pull up to ASU at four 45 and bring me home. And that's how everyone's cars will work. But that seems so, so easy then to say, Hey, actually we're not going to pick up Owen today because he has, he's been speaking out against ASU. So he's not going to go to work until he, he dials that back a little bit. It'd be so easy to decide things like that. Yeah. I think that's right. We're kind of handing over the keys to a lot of a lot of things. I'm a, I'm very uh sort of, I'm not a big supporter of the sort of the uh the you know the renting society. Uh, yeah. You know I I believe that ownership is uh and you know I I think it's um a school of virtue. That's true. Yep. Yeah. And it gives you that sense of making it work, repairing it. Right getting right. to the next stage. Yeah. Just the other day I had to go, my washing machine broke down. I've kept, I've repaired this thing a few times, so I didn't give up on it, but it was done. Went to Home Depot to get one in and all of the, even mid range ones had Wi-Fi, and they're bragging yeah. about how they connect with the, the dryer by Wi-Fi and yeah. somehow coordinate it. And you can, dot, you can be on your phone and tell it when to start. And I'll, I yeah. just said, Hey, I want the basic level. I don't yeah, want that. Right. I want one that just turns the laundry and then yeah. drains it <laughs> and, and yeah. it's a great machine i'm glad i got it but everything is going that direction yeah well again getting back to the internet of things you know and then kind of like okay owen's a problem uh now his washing machine won't work yeah right <laughs> yep <laughs> slow him down yeah right hey right. but thanks so much for your your wisdom today i really appreciate it i know oh. our viewers will love it too so thank you well that's been fun i've enjoyed the conversation thanks for having me on yeah, and for everyone, you'll see in the description where you can follow uh, Pastor Wiley and see his comments. He'll, he'll continue. He's been posting great quotes from the books he's reading on AI. So I hope you'll see that. And thanks for watching.